Between 2003 and 2007, numerous women were attacked in Fairmount Park, located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In April 2003, a 21-year-old woman jogging near Kelly Drive in Fountain Green Road was attacked from behind and then sexually assaulted at knife point. Three months later, on July 13, 2003, Rebecca Park told her boyfriend she was going for a run on the wooded trail near her home as she often did. She would sadly never return. Four days later, her body was tragically found partially undressed and covered in leaves, about 30 feet from the trail. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Rebecca, who was originally from Olney, Maryland, was in her final year at Philadelphia's College of Osteopathic Medicine. Her father described her as a kind young woman who enjoyed spending time outdoors and had plans to start a family with her boyfriend. Again, three months later, on October 25, 2003, another jogger encountered a man who attempted to sexually assault her at knife point on Martin Luther King Drive near Falls Bridge. Thankfully, she was able to fight him off, but during the struggle, she sustained stab wounds to her neck, chest, and hand. Four years later, in 2006, a woman was walking in Pennypack Park near Frankfurt and Solly Avenues when a man grabbed her from behind. He then dragged her into the bushes and sexually assaulted her and robbed her. Investigators would spend the next 20 years trying to locate the man. During that time, the city of Philadelphia was left on edge and fearing they could be his next victim. Unfortunately, investigators didn't have much to go on besides a general description. He was described as a black-haired Hispanic male standing about 5 feet 8 inches tall with a widow's peak and bushy eyebrows. Some victims said he had an earring in his left ear and rode away on a purple bicycle. Then in 2021, police used DNA analysis to create a series of composite sketches of what he likely looked like and released them to the public, hoping they could spur new interest in the cold case. Investigators also sent the DNA to a genealogy lab, which offered insight into the man's family history. The authorities sorted through more than a thousand family members across the mainland U.S. and Puerto Rico. Finally, in April 2023, they were led to a person of interest named Elias Diaz. Diaz had no clear family ties to Philadelphia, but had been arrested for drug possession in December 2007. Family members said he had been estranged for years, but said he was homeless and was known to frequent the Kensington area. However, other family members weren't even sure if he was still alive and heard he had overdosed. When police began to track his movements over the last 20 years, they discovered he was living in the woods of Pennypack Park at one point, and they even found an area he was using for shelter. In November 2023, he was accused of slashing two people with a machete, so he clearly was still alive. The first attack was on the morning of November 22, 2023. A man was running on the trail in the area of 2800 Holmes Avenue and was approaching a bicyclist from behind. As the runner announced his approach, the bicyclist became enraged and slashed the runner with a machete on the arms and hands. Two days later, a man and a woman were walking together on a trail in the area of 2800 Winchester Avenue when the same man approached them on a bike and sliced the man on the arm and hands with his machete. Then on December 6, 2023, a woman called the police to report that a man on a bicycle yelled at her and then tried to attack her on November 25th, but she was able to flee unharmed. On December 17, 2023, police received a call about a man in the park riding a bike with a machete attached to it. An officer responded and found Elias Diaz on the bike and arrested him for attempted murder and assault. Diaz refused to speak to detectives or identify himself, but they quickly learned his name when they processed his fingerprints. Detectives then realized this was the man they'd been searching for all along, and a DNA comparison to the DNA collected from the sexual assaults in 2003 confirmed this. Diaz had been arrested for two crimes in 2007 and 2015, but it wasn't until the November machete attacks in Pennypack Park that he was finally linked to the Fairmount Park sexual assault and murder cases. In addition to the attempted murder and assault charges, he was also charged with sexual assault, attempted sexual assault, kidnapping, attempted kidnapping, and aggravated assault 
in relation to two of the unsolved sexual assault cases from 2003. He was also charged with the sexual assault and murder of 30-year-old Rebecca Park. Hopefully, all these charges will stick and he will never be able to hurt anyone ever again. Investigators believe that Diaz most likely committed other crimes over the years and are now checking his DNA against cases in the system. Karen Marie Humphrey was born on May 14, 1959, and had a brother and six sisters. Her father passed away when she was around 10 years old, leaving her mother, Sylvia, to raise her and her seven siblings. In 1980, 21-year-old Karen was still living with her mother in Smith's Creek, Michigan, and was employed as a secretary at Marysville Marine Distributors, a job she had since high school. She was described as a pleasant, hardworking person who loved being around her family. On November 1, 1980, Karen spent the day getting new rims put on her car. That night, at about 6.30 p.m., she left home with plans to attend a bachelor and bachelorette party for her friends Richard and Kathy at a home on McBrady Street in Port Huron. She left the party with her boyfriend, Fred Hill, and they got into her 1973 Buick. However, an argument quickly broke out and Fred got out of the car near 10th Street and began walking home. Karen got out and followed him for a bit, but eventually returned back to her car, which was parked near 10th and Barney Streets. After that, she was never seen alive again. Later that day, at about 12.10 p.m., two hunters in the state game area of Beards Hills, Michigan, found Karen's body. She was fully clothed and located about 600 feet east of Abbott's Ford Road near a clump of pine trees and had been sexually assaulted and fatally shot. When investigators began looking into the murder, they encountered conflicting reports about whether she left the party at 12.30 or 2.30 a.m. A woman who had been driving in the area called the police at about 3.30 a.m. and reported that a man was attempting to force a woman at gunpoint into a pickup truck near the intersection of 10th and Water Streets. The woman had likely witnessed Karen's abduction. This also makes the 2.30 a.m. time of her leaving the party more likely. The witness was then hypnotized and said the truck was a black or blue 1965 or 1968 Chevrolet without a rear bumper. On October 12, 1994, a woman contacted investigators about a slip of paper she found in her family's Bible. The piece of paper strangely named a suspect in Karen's murder. After bringing in the suspect and performing a polygraph, the person was cleared of involvement. It almost makes you wonder if the lady thought she knew who the murderer was and made up the story about the slip of paper in the Bible. Unfortunately, the case would remain unsolved for over 40 years. In 2022, the Michigan State Police submitted DNA evidence from the crime scene to Othram. Othram scientists created a DNA profile and passed it over to their in-house forensic genetic genealogy team. The team traced the suspect's family tree and handed potential leads to the police to investigate. Detectives worked the leads and determined that her killer was 70-year-old Douglas Laming, who was 42 years old at the time of the murder. In December of 2023, Laming was arrested in his hometown of Fort Gratiot, Michigan, and charged with her murder. He has since stated he had consensual sex with her but didn't kill her. His murder charge was changed from first-degree murder to open murder, which means the jury will decide if it's first or second degree. Sarah Day Snowden was born on May 30, 1921, in Memphis, Tennessee, and went by Sally. By 1982, Sally's children were grown, and she was divorced from her second husband, David McKay. That year, her father, Robert, who once owned the Peabody Hotel in Memphis, passed away. After that, Sally decided to return to the family business, which included 30 lakefront cabins in Horseshoe Lake, Arkansas. She moved into a home close to the Snowden house, which at the time was being leased by a couple who had turned it into a bed and breakfast. In 1996, 75-year-old Sally was divorced and was still living a few houses down from the Snowden family in Horseshoe Lake, Arkansas. 
Her nephew, Joseph Lee Baker, who went by Lee, had moved him, his wife, and their three children into one of her cabins about 100 yards from Sally's home after their home was destroyed by a fire on August 12, 1996. That fire was determined to be arson, and investigators determined the motive was to cover up a burglary. On June 10, 1996, 53-year-old Lee went over to Sally's home to discuss some business matters. While there, someone entered her home, shot both her and Lee, and then set the home on fire. Once again, investigators determined the motive was burglary. The suspect had even stolen Sally's red Toyota Camry and crashed it into a tree about a mile from the house. The investigation eventually led them to 16-year-old Travis Lewis, who lived on one of the properties on the Snowden estate and was good friends with Lee's two sons. However, he denied knowing anything about the murders and even passed a polygraph test. When police learned that Travis was suspended from school on the day of the murders, they asked him to come in for a second polygraph test, and this time he failed. After questioning Travis for some time, he admitted to the burglary at Lee's home, but claimed a friend who was with him when he broke into Sally's home was the one who actually murdered them. However, that friend had an airtight alibi. When forensics checked Sally's wrecked car, they found Travis's DNA and fingerprints. He was then charged with two counts of murder and a series of other felony charges related to the burglaries. Police suspect Sally and Lee walked in on Travis as he was committing a robbery at her home. He shot them, then set the house on fire in an attempt to cover up the evidence. Unfortunately for Travis, alert neighbors noticed flames coming from the home and dialed 911 almost immediately after the blaze began. This was not Travis's first run-in with the law. He already had a juvenile record that included a conviction for assault. For the murders of Sally and Lee, he was charged as an adult, which made him eligible for the death penalty. However, the family showed mercy and agreed to let prosecutors give him a plea deal for 28 and a half years behind bars. In time, Sally's daughter, Martha McKay, forgave Travis and even formed a close bond with him after he was behind bars. In 2018, he was unfortunately paroled and Martha let him move into the Snowden family home with her. She had purchased the home her mother owned and restored the property. Once it was restored, she opened the home as a lavish bed and breakfast, letting Travis stay in one of the rooms and gave him a job keeping up the grounds. At some point, Martha had sold a chandelier for $10,000 and stashed the cash away in her home. However, the money quickly came up missing, and since Travis was the only other person in the home at the time, it couldn't have been anyone else. Martha was left with no other option but to fire him and kick him out of the house. On March 25, 2020, Travis returned, broke into the home, and stabbed and bludgeoned 63-year-old Martha to death. Before she died, she was able to press an electronic alert that was connected to the home's alarm system. When police arrived, they found her body at the top of the staircase inside the home. I will say that karma's a bitch because after Travis fled by jumping out an upstairs window and getting his vehicle stuck in the yard, he got out and jumped into the nearby Horseshoe Lake where he drowned before police could rescue him. Ava Wood was born on June 20th, 2008 to parents Heather and Christopher. She was described as an amazing, funny, competitive young girl who could always make you laugh with the silly things she said and did. In 2023, 14-year-old Ava was living in Baldwinsville, New York, primarily with her father, 51-year-old Christopher, and was a ninth grader at Durgy Junior High. She excelled in school and was also a talented soccer player and a member of the school track team. After her parents separated, Christopher began harassing Ava's mother, Heather. He had even stalked her in March of 2022, which led to Heather calling the police on him. She said he should not have known where she was, but would somehow find her and show up routinely at her location, followed by repeated calls to her. She felt sorry for him and his attempts at trying to keep their relationship together and only called the police because she wanted his actions documented for the impending divorce. Unfortunately, after their separation, Christopher's depression and mental health worsened. 
It would later be revealed that during their relationship, Christopher was mentally abusive toward Heather. Unbeknownst to Heather and Ava, Christopher purchased a 20-gauge shotgun on January 4th. 14 days later, on January 18th, 2023, Heather received several harassing text messages from an anonymous number. She called and reported them to the police. When deputies asked Christopher about the text messages, he claimed he received similar messages, even showing officers screenshots of them. The very next evening, he and Heather spoke on the phone, and he said something she will never forget. He said, this is how it ends for us. She had no idea how ominous this statement really was. Even with all of this, Heather nor the police thought Christopher would turn to violence. On January 20th, 2023, Heather, realizing that Ava had not left for school yet, went by the house and knocked on the door, but there was no answer. Concerned for her daughter's safety, she quickly called the police and requested a welfare check. When deputies entered the home, they found Ava's body on her bed with a gunshot wound to the head. They then found Christopher's body in another bedroom with a shotgun nearby. The sheriff said that Christopher left behind a note, but the contents have never been released. Unfortunately, it's a tragic end to a beautiful life. Mental illness is a serious issue in our country, so please take care of yourselves. There's help if you are struggling. All you have to do is call 988. On September 28, 1979, a reporter at the Tahoe Tribune received an anonymous call about a body at a campground at Sugar Pine Point State Park. When police arrived, they found the body of an unidentified woman in the picnic area wearing a red shirt and jeans. She had sadly been beaten and strangled to death. It also appeared she had been chased through the picnic area, losing one of her flip-flops along the way. Unfortunately, with no way to identify her, she was buried in a grave marked unknown female. Despite collecting DNA from the assault, her case would remain unsolved for 43 years. The individuals who found her body called the newspaper instead of the police because they had warrants out for their arrest. Police believe she may have still been alive when they found her, but because they didn't directly call the police, she died before she could receive help. In 2015, her body was exhumed, and detectives placed photos of her jewelry in a newspaper, and her family members recognized the deer pendant the Jane Doe had been wearing when she was killed. After comparing the family's DNA to that of the victim, she was identified as 35-year-old Patricia Carnahan of Virginia. Her body was then released to the family so they could have a proper burial. Patricia disappeared while on a solo road trip around California. Her Volkswagen van was found abandoned at a car dealership in Venice, California, and she was reported missing in October 1979, one month after her body was found. Once she was identified, investigators got to work tracking down her killer. In 1994, investigators collected DNA from a sexual assault victim. Turns out that DNA matched the DNA from Patricia's crime scene and was linked to a man named Harold Carpenter. However, they were not able to take him to trial in 1994 because he claimed the encounter with the victim was consensual and they had no way to prove it otherwise. Harold would have been 19 years old when he murdered Patricia. He had been homeless since 2016 and had a long criminal history, including drug possession, an arrest in 1998 for domestic battery, and another accusation of sexual assault in 2018. Once they confirmed the DNA, 63-year-old Harold was arrested in 2023 at his apartment in downtown Spokane, Washington, and charged with her murder. 